with the city at four Ghana cities 20 pesos in December 2016 is trading with the city at about nine Ghana cities. I just checked it before I walked here. I walked into the hall. Nine Ghana cities. This has resulted in the deterioration of the capital of most bulk oil distribution companies and oil marketing companies. These entities who are struggling to break even are left with no option than to pass on the knock-on effect of the currency depreciation to the final consumer. This is what has mainly resulted in persistent and astronomical increases at the pumps, which have moved the price of a gallon of diesel from about 14 Ghana cities as of December 2016 to as high as 60 Ghana cities as we speak. As a matter of fact, the price of a liter of diesel today, which is 13 cities, 30 pesos, is almost the same as what the price of a gallon, a gallon is made up of 4.5 liters. But today, the price of a liter of diesel, which is 13.3 Ghana cities, 13 cities, 30 pesos, I repeat, is almost the same as what the price of a gallon of diesel used to be in the year 2016. 14 Ghana cities. This is how bad things have become in this country under the bad leadership of the Bawumia led economic management team. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe you all recall the solemn pledge of President Ekufuad and Alaji Bawumia to move Ghanaians from taxation to production. Well, needless to say that this promise, like similar others, has become a pipe dream as we have instead progressed from taxation to more taxation and more and more taxation. With no effort nor commitment whatsoever on the part of this government to reduce the level of tax payments in the country. Instead of moving us from taxation to production as they promised, this government has introduced a raft of needless taxes like never seen before on the price border of fuel. One of such taxes is the 10 pesos sanitation levy imposed by the Ekufuado Bawumia government on every liter of petrol and diesel. Never has it been heard in our history, ladies and gentlemen, that a government has to rely on a special tax handle on fuel to keep our surroundings clean. We insist that the introduction of this levy in this time of extreme economic difficulties, and in this time that we are engulfed with filth, even in the capital city of Accra, is unjustifiable, unacceptable, and smacks of insensitivity of the highest order. Another tax handle that this government has nominally increased and extended on the price buildup of fuel is a special petroleum tax. The 17.5% ad valerum special petroleum tax was introduced in the year 2015 at a time the international market price of crude oil, which was projected at $94 for that year, had declined to below $50. The SPT thus was a temporary tax measure meant to show up declining oil revenues for development purposes. You all recall how the MPP, while in opposition, berated the ex wal NDC Mahama government for introducing this tax, bastardized same, and labeled it as a nuisance tax, promising to scrap same if elected. Interestingly, since this government came into office, they have changed the special petroleum tax from an ad valerum tax of 41 pesos as of December 2016, to a straight tax of 46 pesos per liter of petrol and diesel. Even though the special petroleum tax has outlived its usefulness, owing to the fact that the international market price of crude oil today, or in recent time, has risen to as high as $107, $117 per barrel, a situation that has given government huge windfall profit as captured at paragraph 27 of the 2022 mid-year budget review statement. 
spite of all this, the insensitive Akufu Adobawumia government continues to charge Ghanaians a special petroleum tax of 46 pesos on every liter of diesel and petrol, even in these difficult times. We submit that the continuous maintenance of the special petroleum tax on the price buildup of fuel by the Akufu Adobawumia government when the reasons for its introduction no longer exist, is no longer tenable. Friends from the media, again, one of the taxes on fuel with the MPP while in opposition, vehemently opposed and promised to scrap if elected, is the Energy Sector Levies Act, ESLA, which was introduced by the ex NDC Mahama government in the year 2015 to clear legacy deaths that were crippling the energy sector at the time. Instead of scrapping this tax as they promised, and very typical of them, the tax has rather been increased by 30% and has been collateralized for a loan which has extended the duration of the tax from its original duration of five years to 2015, that is until 2035. As if that was not enough, the Akufu Wado Babumia government only last year, 2021, introduced a new energy sector levy of 20 pesos per liter of diesel and petrol and 18 pesos per kilogram of LPG. Here again, we submit that the imposition of these so-called energy sector levies on Ghanaians in this time of extreme economic hardships is callous and totally unacceptable. Ladies and gentlemen, in addition to these taxes I have enumerated, is a price stabilization and recovery levy of 16 pesos and 14 pesos per liter of petrol and diesel respectively, which we all as consumers pay in the time we buy fuel. This tax is meant to be used to subsidize the cost of premise fuel and more importantly, to subsidize the prices of fuel at the downstream sector for fuel consumers when the international market price of crude oil goes up like we have experienced in recent times. There are conservative estimates, corroborated by ASEP's estimates. The Kufuado Bawomia government has collected in excess of 3 billion Ghana cities in price stabilization and recovery levies in the last five and a half years, but has woefully failed to apply these funds for their intended use, which is to cushion fuel consumers. These crippling fuel taxes and other existing margins on the price buildup of fuel, such as the bus margin, which has been increased by 200% from 3 pesos to 9 pesos, we understand it has been brought down to 9 pesos, 7 pesos now. The fuel market margin among others, are what have conspired with the continuous depreciation of the Ghana city to make the prices of fuel excessively high in Ghana, and in fact, far higher than the prices of fuel in the sub region and in our neighboring countries. Friends from the media, what is even more painful is that fact that on top of all these crippling taxes heaped on the price buildup of fuel, the Kufu Adobawumia government has imposed certain obnoxious taxes on the Ghanaian people that have further escalated the hardships in the country to unbearable proportions. After receiving more than enough inflows, totaling about 35 billion Ghana cities, equivalent to about 5 billion US dollars to manage and mitigate the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And after spending only 12 billion of this amount on the pandemic as reported by the finance minister to parliament a few months ago, government last year imposed a 1% COVID levy on the National Health Insurance levy on VAT, thereby increasing it from 2.5% to 3.5%. And another COVID levy of 1% on the VAT flat rate of 3%, thereby increasing it to 4%. At a time, 
friends from the media, responsible governments all over the world are questioning their citizens in one way or the other to provide them with some relief against the debilitating impact of the pandemic on their businesses and their livelihoods. Our government is punishing us with this offensive and punitive tax that simply defies logic. This is a tragedy of monumental proportions because, ladies and gentlemen, nowhere in the world, no world in the sub-region, nowhere in the Africa continent, and I dare say the world, has any government imposed a COVID levy on its people. And at no point in the history of this country has any government imposed a tax handle for the management of any disease on the Guinean people? Do we have an HIV levy or a malaria levy? Why then must we have a COVID-19 levy? As if the offensive COVID-19 levies were not enough, the Carlos Akufuado Bawumia government again, against good counsel and wide public outcry, has stubbornly imposed another punitive 1.5% levy on Momo and electronic transactions known as the e-levy. This is after the vice president and chairman of the economic management team, Alaji Baumia, promised Ghanaians in the run-up to the 2020 elections in an interview on Peace FM that Momo transactions are mainly patronized by the poor, hence must not and will not be taxed by the MPP. This obnoxious e-levy which is applied on the capital, savings, and already taxed incomes of Ghanaians defies all the known principles of taxation in Ghana. The stealth tax has significantly reduced Momo transaction volumes and has become a great disincentive to digitalization in Ghana as it has forced many people to find smart ways of avoiding the use of digital platforms for financial transactions. Little wonder that today government has only realized a paltry 93 million Ghana cities as against a projected 1.4 billion Ghana cities from the tax handle for the first half of the year 2022. As we in the NDC argued and predicted during the debate over the passage of the e-levy, it has today become apparent that the e-levy is not the panacea to the economic rules of Kenyans, as we were promised by the deceitful and clueless Akufuado Bawumia government. You will recall what they said about the e-levy and how it was going to be the magic wand that was going to turn our economic situation around. He said, through the e-levy, they were going to build new roads, create one million jobs through a, so -called, a program called Ustat. Any problem in this country, according to the MPP, was going to be fixed with the e-levy. Even when you complained of stomach ache, they told you that pay e-levy, you'll be fine. Today, they bulldoze their way through with the e-levy. We are paying the e-levy, and yet all these problems are escalating. After displaying dismissive and stonewalled stubbornness, the finance minister, Ken Furiata, has now revised his over-ambitious end-of-year e-levy target from 6.9 billion Ghana cities to about 614, 640 million Ghana cities, which we doubt would even be realized. Even more bizarre and pathetic is the fact that the counterproductive e-levy is sometimes charged on the first 100 Ghana cities sent by some Ghanaians to their loved ones in a day, despite saying being exempted under the e-levy act. Ladies and gentlemen, this is naked TV being perpetrated by the Akufuado government against already impoverished taxpayers and ought to be condemned by all well-meaning Guineans. Now, I proceed to deal with our ever-worsening exchange rates due to our worsening fiscal position. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, our worsening exchange rates continues to play a major role in driving inflation and therefore requires further attention. When I say exchange rates, simple terms, I'm talking about the dollar rates. 
friends from the media, it has now become clear to the MPP that the city has a mind of its own and can neither be managed nor tamed by empty talk and sloganeering as it continues to stutter quite peaceably against all of its major trading currencies and has recently been rated as the worst currency among top African currencies, having depreciated by over 17% this year alone. It is without doubt that this government has been the luckiest and most resourced government in the history of the Fourth Republic. They inherited three oil fields with unprecedented oil revenues from the ex Mahama administration. They have borrowed more monies than all governments put together since independence and have had access to over $11 billion in euro bonds alone, as compared to the $3.7 billion the ex Mahama government got from euro bonds and the $750 million the ex MPP Kufu administration got from euro bonds. They alone have gotten $11 billion. What this means is that this government has had access to more forests, or simply put, more dollars than any government in history, yet has woefully failed to maintain a stable currency due to their wastefulness and mismanagement of the economy. The major factor that accounts for the alarming rate of the depreciation of the city is the huge capital outflows from our country, occasioned by our poor credit ratings and the loss of investor confidence in our economy. In simple terms, our ever ballooning public debt and budget deficits as a country has now reached unsustainable levels due to the reckless spending and excessive borrowings of the Ekufu Adobawumia government. This recklessness reached its crescendo in the year 2022, when under the guise of fighting COVID-19, government went on an election-driven spending spree, leading to an unprecedented budget deficit of 15.7%. The confessions of one Felicia Tete, the MPP's 2020 parliamentary candidate for Sadnerugu and vice chairperson for Northern Region, captured on tape, lends ample proof to how COVID-19 fans were doled out to MPP functionaries and apparatchiks in the name of COVID-19 relief. It is this recklessness, ladies and gentlemen, that has plunged the country into the bottomless pit we presently find ourselves in. By kind courtesy of the excessive and consumption-driven borrowings of President Kufuadu and Alaji Bagumia, Ghana's total public debt has ballooned from 120 billion Ghana cities as of December 2016 to a whopping 393 billion Ghana cities as of June 2022. What this means is that this government has added a whopping 273 billion Ghana cities to our public debt in the last five and a half years. This has moved our debt to GDP ratio from 56% in 2016 to over 80%, while debt servicing, interest payment amortization, has increased from 11 billion Ghana cities in 2016 to over 50 billion as we speak, representing a 500% increase. Today, Ghana's fiscal position has so much deteriorated under the watch of the Baumia led economic management team that our total tax revenue as a country is consumed by just one budget line item, debt servicing. For instance, for the first quarter of this year, 2022, tax revenue collection stood at about 12 billion Ghana cities while debt servicing alone stood at over 13 billion Ghana cities. In other words, we spent about 107% of tax revenue on only debt servicing for the first quarter of 2022 alone. 
this poor fiscal position of the country, created by the recklessness and mismanagement of the Babumia-led economic management team, has tremendously increased our risk of debt default, worsened our credit ratings, led to our downgrade by sovereign rating agencies such as Fitch and Moody's, made us lose access to the capital markets, and resulted in huge capital outflows from the economy, thereby causing the city to depreciate at a very alarming rate. As a matter of fact, Ghana has been ranked number two on Bloomberg's latest sovereign debt vulnerability ranking published a few days ago. Of all the countries in the world, Ghana has been ranked as a second country with the highest risk of debt default. Even Somalia, Zimbabwe, Ukraine, and countries at war, countries under military rule, Syria, are all doing better relative to their debt position than Ghana. We only performed better than a country called El Salvador in Central America, with a population of about 6.8 million people who have had to deal with a recent slump after adopting Bitcoin as its official currency. So when you El Salvador, Dianka, you cry. What an enviable feat, shocked by the Bawumia led economic management team. Indeed, the MPP have the men. What a solid team. Ladies and gentlemen, until the Akufuado Bawumia government learned to live within its means and cut their coats according to the size of their cloth, until they stop making unrealistic fiscal projections based on cooked data, until they cut expenditure drastically and reduce their rate of borrowing and debt accumulation, the alarming rate of capital outflows will continue because our fiscal position will worsen, investor confidence in our economy will dip further, will continue to go down, and the city will have no other option than to depreciate. And if care is not taken, the city or the dollar may end up at 10 Ghana cities by December 2022, because as I speak to you, you need about nine Ghana cities to buy a dollar. Now to an issue that young people are very much interested in, Western unemployment situation. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you are all aware of the Western levels of unemployment in our country today. This is a government that came to power in 2016 on the back of a promise to create jobs. This promise has, however, only yielded lip service and high faluting sloganeering with next to nothing by way of real jobs created. It is instructive to note that the rate of unemployment has increased from 8.4% in 2016, 2017. Not according to me, but according to the Ghana Living Standards Service 7, conducted by the Ghana Statistical Service, to 13.4% in 2021, according to the latest population and housing census conducted by the same institution. After inheriting an unemployment rate of 8.4% in 2016-2017, the Akufu Aruba Wumia government has created phantom jobs with their maths through their so-called flagship programs such as One District, One Factory, One Village, One Dam, Planting for Food and Jobs, NABCO, uh, the latest one is what Ghana cares or Batampa. These people are good in slogans. Use that. And the results of all these job creating flagship programs is that unemployment rate has increased from 8.4% to 13.4%. The very latest of these grand deceptive slogans, as I mentioned, is a Use Start program which was supposed to be a $1 billion investment in the creation of 1 million entrepreneurial jobs. That also 
has turned out as a complete fiasco. Because according to the mid-year budget review statement presented by the finance minister only last week, only 46 persons and eight associations have received support under the so-called USTAD program. To make matters worse, trainees under the NABCO program who are owed nine months allowance, allowance IRS by the government, and were deceitfully promised permanent integration into the public service by the government, have been laid off and asked to join the non-functioning USTAT program. Even more bizarre is the fact that till date, staff of the collapsed banks and other financial institutions have not been paid their severance packages. While the private sector which is supposed to be the engine of growth and job creation, continues to suffocate under the yoke of high cost of doing business. Distinguished friends from the media, one of the cardinal sins of this Akufu Adobawumia government is their misplaced priorities that have underlined government's expenditure in the last five and a half years. If you are one of those who have been wondering what the billions of tax revenues, borrowed funds, euro bonds, all your revenues and donor funds totaling about 500 billion Ghana cities that have accrued to this government have been used for, look no further. Just check the Auditor General's reports from 2017 to 2020, and you'll be shocked at how this government continued to waste mega state resources on profligacy, consumption, and corruption, and other financial irregularities. Even in these times of extreme economic difficulties. That presidents who were once accomplished businessmen, like the South African president, Cyril Ramaphosa, are traveling on economic class and so on. Others traveling on business class. Our president continues to fly around the globe in hyper expensive and ultra luxurious private jets, like an Arabian king at a cost of $20,000 to the already impoverished taxpayer. Fellow countrymen and women, it is totally unacceptable. It is totally unacceptable that at a time when government cannot afford to print test books for busy school children, at a time when secondary schools, nursing training institutions, Colleges of education are confronted with an acute food crisis. And many Ghanaians are struggling to afford one square meal a day. Government will continue to waste the meager resources of state on the rental of luxurious private jets for the president and on other wasteful expenditures. But ladies and gentlemen of the press, we are all too familiar with the numerous excuses that have been canvassed by the Kufuado Bawumia led administration and their many apologies for plunging our country into this unprecedented economic turmoil. Despite having profited immensely from COVID 19 inflows, this government has sought to blame COVID 19 for everything in Ghana today, including even when the sun fails to rise. Even though we admit that, like all countries in the world, the COVID-19 pandemic and the Russian-Ukraine war have had negative effects on the, our economy, these global factors are not the major factors that have plunged us into the economic mess we have on our hands. For emphasis, neither COVID-19 nor the five months old Russian-Ukrainian war is to blame for the economic malice we have on our hands. And we say so for the following reasons. Number one, Ghana's economy showed signs of serious challenges even before COVID-19 struck. The World Bank's country director has been emphatic that our economic challenges persisted before COVID-19, the COVID-19 crisis. For instance, before COVID-19 was recorded in Ghana in March 2020, for those who are interested in statistics, the public debt 
had increased from 120 billion as of December 2016 to 225 billion, representing a nominal increase of 105 billion Ghana cities in our public debt stock already. That was before COVID. Our debt to GDP had increased from 56% as of December 2016 to 64% in 2019 before COVID. Debt servicing, the amount of money we spend on interest on our debt and on the principal that becomes due, had increased from 11 billion in 2016 to 37 billion in 2019 and constituted about 90% of tax revenue. That was before COVID. The budget deficit, which is the measure or which is an indicator of how responsible or reckless a government is. Because the budget deficit is simply the difference between expenditure and revenue. The budget deficit had hit 7.5% in 2018 and 7% in 2019, even though government dubiously tried to conceal it from the people by claiming it was 4.8%. It is instructive to note that the 2019 budget deficit of 7% was above the fiscal responsibility or the fiscal uh, uh, threshold of 5%. So even before COVID, government had exceeded its own fiscal threshold of a budget deficit of 5%. They were doing budget deficit of 7% and above, which means that they were being reckless already. The recklessness had long started, and they were spending far more than we were generating in revenue. They were living beyond their means. The Ghana CD in 2019 saw depreciation of 12.9%. That is almost 13%. This was before COVID-19. And if you recall, the government at the time announced, was it a 19-member committee? And my senior brother, Frank Kujo, was a member of that committee to investigate the reasons for the depreciation of the CD. That was before COVID. It, was, it is worthy of note that the CD depreciated by 9.6% in 2016, despite the many serious global and domestic challenges the country was confronted with. Again, before COVID, growth rate for the construction sector had declined from 8.4% in 2016 to negative 8.5% in 2019. Negative 8.5%. And the growth of the manufacturing sector had declined from a growth rate of 7.9% in 2016 to 6.5% in 2019 under the much touted One District One Factory Initiative, even before the COVID-19 pandemic. Secondly, the reason why COVID-19 cannot be blamed for economic woes is that even though the COVID-19 pandemic has had some negative effects on Ghana's economy, its overall impact on tax revenue has been insignificant. In 2019, before COVID, the Ghana Revenue Authority raked in tax revenue of 43.9 billion. So let's say 44 billion Ghana cities. In 2020, when COVID struck, government projected tax revenue of 47.2 billion, revised same to 42.7 billion because of the pandemic, but recorded more tax revenue of 45.3 billion. In 2021, government projected tax revenue of 57 billion, but recorded the total tax revenue of 57.32 billion. That is a 270, 265 million Ghana cities. Excess. In short, unlike other countries, tax revenue in Ghana has seen consistent steep increases despite the advent of COVID. Thirdly, the Akufuado Bawumia government has had close to 35 billion Ghana cities, equivalent to $5 billion, to manage and mitigate the impact of COVID-19, all of which has largely been wasted on election-related expenses. Our peers, such as Cote d'Ivoire, Benin, Togo, etc., did not get as much as $5 million to manage COVID-19. But these countries have done far better than Ghana in managing the pandemic and mitigating this devastating impact on their economies. Number four, 
the Kufu Adoba Wumia government has had revenue from three oil fields, with daily production increasing from 70,000 barrels per day, with daily production increasing from about 70,000 barrels in 2016, sorry, to about 170,000 barrels, coupled with high commodity prices. And here I'm talking about oil, gold, and cocoa on the international market. In all, this government has had total revenue of over 500 billion Ghana cities, as compared to the total revenue of 200 billion that accrued to the XYL and DC Mahama government. Their economic mismanagement and wastefulness is what has led us into another IMF program. Any government that has had access to over 500 billion Ghana cities in revenue and still collapses the economy to the point of needing an IMF bailout must be the worst government in the history of the world. Finally, COVID has affected all countries in the world, including Ghana. It was a pandemic for God's sake. But whereas our peers such as Benin, Togo, Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, Nigeria, were very responsible in how they spent in 2020 to manage and mitigate the impact of the pandemic on their economies, thereby recording deficits of below 8% and debt to GDP ratios of below 65%, the Akufuado Bagumia government borrowed excessively and spent recklessly for election purposes, thereby recording a, high, a record high deficit of 15.7% and a debt to GDP ratio of close to 80% in 2020. In the year 2020, when the COVID pandemic struck, Burkina Faso recorded a deficit of 5.7%, Cote d'Ivoire recorded a deficit of 5.6%, Nigeria recorded a deficit of 5.8%, and Senegal recorded a deficit of 6.4%. But Ghana alone recorded a deficit of 15.7% because of the reckless election-driven expenses and wastage the MPP of Kufuado Bawumia government engaged in. Did COVID-19 affect Ghana than it did our neighbors? How come that none of these countries who were all affected by the pandemic are recording double digit deficits and high debt to GDP ratios of about 80%. How come none of these countries are recording inflation rates of 30%? To quote Dr. Bagumia, how did COVID-19 and the four months old Russia-Ukraine war jump over Nigeria, Benin, Cote d'Ivoire, Togo, and our other neighbors to attack only Ghana. Your guess is as good as mine. Ladies and gentlemen, the truth of the matter is that the economic mess we have on our hands has largely been brought about by the reckless spending, excessive borrowing, and crass economic mismanagement of the Bawumia led economic management team. In conclusion, friends from the media, the economic hardships Ghanaians are currently reeling under today can be discussed all day, and yet there will be still space to contain the story of the tragic mismanagement of our economy by the Okufuado Bawumia led government. The continuous mismanagement of our economy by the Bawumia led economic management team has borne various negative fruits and occasioned manifest difficulty for the generality of our people. It was clear from day one that Ghana's economic train was headed for a ditch, yet President Ekufuado has watched with complicit indolence for al Haji Bawumia and his cousin, the finance minister, Ken Ufuriata, to keep the steering wheel to a point of no return. Against all wisdom, sound counsel and pep talk from us in opposition, civil society and you in the media, this government refused to take remedial steps early on and will not repent from recklessness, profligacy, and misplaced priorities. Today, our economy is gasping for breath and has finally landed at the doorstep of the IMF. In case you want to know the economic temperature of Guineans today, just a stroll into one of the nearby markets at Nima, or Bawumia's favorite market, 
whilst he was in opposition, Malata. We reveal this reality to you. Today, an Oloka of Gary, which used to sell at five Ghana cities in 2016, is going for 14 Ghana cities. While a paint bucket of tomato, which used to sell at eight Ghana cities in 2016 in Accra, is now being sold at 50 Ghana cities. Similarly, a bag of cement, which used to be sold at 27 Ghana cities in 2016, is now being sold for 62, as some places, 63 Ghana cities. Whereas the 1.5 mm cable metal that used to be sold at 78 Ghana cities is now being sold at 222 Ghana cities. We are not saying that prices must come down. Prices will obviously go up because of inflation. But just look at the quantum of increases we are witnessing now, unprecedented. In similar vein, ladies and gentlemen, a bag of pure water that used to be sold for one city 50 pesos in 2016 is today being sold for eight Ghana cities. A crate of eggs has increased from 12 Ghana cities to 36 Ghana cities. And a bag of maize, that is the one I find most shocking, a bag of maize has increased from 170 Ghana cities to a whopping 650 Ghana cities. In fact, somebody is telling me from the audience that it is now about 700 or what Ghana cities. Ladies and gentlemen, even the president's one's favorite drink, Kalipo, which he drank for fame in 2016 at a cool price of 50 pesos, is today being sold for a whopping two cities, 50 pesos. How can parents afford to keep their kids happy with Kalipo when Kalipo is now being sold as such a prohibitive? Price. President Dekufuadu may not be aware of this because now he doesn't drink Kalipo again. He drinks very expensive champagne. But we just want him to take notes. This, ladies and gentlemen, may be funny, but it is a sad reality of Ghanaians today. It is our sad reality. Almost everybody is feeling the brunt of the current economic hardship, driven mainly by food inflation, high fuel prices, carlos taxes, among others. It goes without saying that parents and households are suffering. Public sector workers are suffering. Teachers are suffering. Teacher trainees are suffering. Nurses are suffering. And nursing trainees are suffering. Lecturers are suffering, and students are suffering. Market women are suffering, and drivers are suffering. Napco trainees whose fate is unknown are suffering, and police officers are suffering. Even you, the media, are suffering. And the communication bureau is also suffering. All Ghanaians are suffering. All because of the bad leadership of the Bawumia led economic management team. Most Ghanaians are now aware that President Kufuado doesn't care about the hardships we are reeling under. Otherwise, why would he continue to appoint new ministers when Ghanaians are urging him to downsize his government? Added to this, is the callous and insensitive burdens being imposed on Ghanaians by the Minister of Communications, the arrogant Osla Uzu, in respect of SIM card registration, which like other policies concerning recent telecom measures, are mere measures intended to line the pockets of individuals while Ghanaians grow under the yoke of hardships. The insensitive Akufuado Bawumia government must understand that there will be a day of reckoning. As a responsible opposition, and indeed a government in waiting, we in the NDC cannot sit aloof while our economy descends into the precipice. Despite the recalcitrance 
of this government and its sometimes antagonistic attitude to constructive criticisms and ideas, we cannot afford to allow this present state of affairs to continue to fester. It is for this reason that we call on Ghanaians to join us in demanding that the Akufu Adobawumia government takes urgent steps to ameliorate our suffering and help stabilize the economy. To this end, we demand the immediate repeal of the obnoxious and the counterproductive E-Levy Act of 1.5% on Momo and electronic transactions. Number two, we demand the immediate repeal of the punitive COVID-19 levy of 1% on the VAT flat rate and on NHIL. Number three, we demand the immediate scrapping of crippling fuel taxes such as the special petroleum tax that has outlived its usefulness, the boiler tax, the new energy sector levy of 20 pesos per liter of diesel and petrol, and 18 pesos per kilogram of LPG. Number four, we demand the immediate suspension of the 9 pesos boss margin, and the price stabilization and recovery levy of 16 pesos and 14 pesos per liter of petrol and diesel respectively, both of which are not being applied for their intended purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, the last two puzzles for this government to resolve, if it is serious about bringing our economy back on track and restoring investor confidence, is to get rid, I repeat, is to get rid of the two villains who have been at the center of wrecking this havoc on our economy. First on the list is without doubt the finance minister, Ken Ufuriata, who has proven to be an unmitigated disaster when it comes to economic management. President Kufuado's cousin has run down our economy through excessive borrowings that his personal company, Data Bank, profits from. Today, his name scares away investors and evokes a feeling of insecurity for every Ghanaian. Kenoferiata has become like stale water in a bottle. And the earlier President Kufuado fired his underperforming cousin, the better for the economy and all of us. As the venerable former president, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama recently said, regardless of our running to the IMF, the only way to begin the process of rebuilding, if we are to get any good deal from the IMF, is to sack Ken Furiata immediately and appoint a fresh, able hand in his stead to lead the IMF negotiations. And I'm sure you will agree with me. The next important thing for President Kufuadu to do is to relieve his jocular vice president, Alaji Bawumia, from his position as head of the economic management team. The one so-called solid economic management team has now become a gaseous team who have deserted their roles and are nowhere to be found in these difficult and critical times. It is about time our tired, clueless, incompetent, and comical vice president is finally relieved for new ideas and competent hands to take over and steer the economic management team at this time of unspeakable hardships. Distinguished friends, we have no doubt that if President Ekufuado, who has so far proven to be held strong and unreceptive to good counsel, will listen for once he could begin process of breathing life back into our ailing economy, which is almost at the point of comatose. Until then, our help is in the Lord. May God continue to bless our homeland, Ghana. Thank you very much for your attention. So, ladies and gentlemen, because I know you have no questions for me, I will quickly do a very, very brief summary in Chi because of the account stations here. As well, I'll plead with media men present here just to keep your cameras in position and just to uh, remain in your seats for the next 10 minutes for the sake of the account stations here. Some of whom are streaming. 
Thanks for staying with us here on the Join News uh, channel. What you see there live on the screen is the National Communications Officer for the NDC, Sami JV, addressing the press, stating the opposition party's uh, official um, position on Ghana's uh, economic condition, uh, making a number of demands and asking government to scrap some taxes. We'll definitely pay attention to uh, much more of the fallouts and bring you some uh, updates. But you're also watching the polls here on the Join News channel. Still to come, all Fair Wages and Salaries Commission concludes uh, modalities for the payment of the cost of living allowances to public sector workers, but it's actually unclear exactly when the money will hit their accounts. Realizing the money in your pocket, we are working on the schedule, and I'm sure maybe in about uh, two weeks to three weeks' time, government will come up public with the exact date that you have it in your pocket, but it will be very soon. Stay with us as we hear from the Commission as they sign a pact with interest state organizations to reduce payroll fraud. It's all coming up here on The Pulse. And no Ghana card, no votes. That's the warning from the Electoral Commission to prospective voters ahead of the 2024 elections. Stay with me as we engage the Deputy Chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Dr. Eric Bosman Asari. He's my special guest. This afternoon on the polls, I am blessed with another polls as always is brought to you by Global Communities Digni Lu, affordable safe sanitation. Remember, this afternoon we're streaming live on YouTube and all of our social media handles is at Joy News on TV. Thanks for choosing us. And this afternoon, the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission says it has successfully completed drafting modalities for the payment of the cost of living allowances, COLA, for all public sector workers. CEO Ben Arthur tells Joy News government is required to shortly announce when workers can begin to receive the allowance in their accounts. Demands for COLA uh, resulted in weeks of labor agitation and industrial actions forcing government to commit to paying the workers some 15% of their basic salaries. Mr. Atta uh, has been speaking to Joy News on the sidelines of a signing of a memorandum of understanding with the Internal Audit Agency to check payroll fraud. MOU with uh, IA is premised on the fact that fair wages is mandated to do payroll monitoring. But knowing our size and knowing very well that we are not in every office, especially the public offices, we are not having decks everywhere. But Internal Audit Agency has units in almost all the public uh, sector institutions. So we're collaborating with them for them to share relevant information with us, for us to do the same. And not only that, anytime they are able to discover anomalies, especially as to the sources of pay structure and who has mandated what, we should be able to share relevant information and take the appropriate action. We are doing this to serve Mother Ghana and to ensure that you'll be able to protect the public purse. That's the main reason behind this collaboration. We will not stop here. We are currently in talks with SIGA, and eventually we'll get to the audit service and try and sign similar MOUs with them to collaborate. The idea of collaboration is golden in this matter because working in silos has not helped. We have other institutions with similar mandate along certain lines. The time has come for us to collaborate and to ensure that the right things are done. And the biggest issue when you talk about payroll mostly has to do with uh, people talking about payroll fraud and uh, ghost names on, on payroll and all those things. Are those things that we can practically expect some changes to, to be made to us in terms of this particular de de Definitely. This MOU will go a long way okay. in curbing that uh, canker, if I should put it that way. We admit there are times that we detect ghost names, but working together, such as we have agreed to do, will go a long way to eliminating ghost workers on government payroll. Mm. With a frequent monitoring, I'm sure that we'll be able to undertake this exercise effectively. I mean, quite recently, we know the commission has been intervening in some labor issues, the coal and all those issues. What's the latest on that? The latest is that that agreement still stands, and we are certain that government will implement it. So nobody should have doubts in their minds. As soon as possible, we will communicate to you 
later on this, but we promise that it will be effective from July. Effective means that that is when the implementation starts. Realizing the money in your pocket, we are working on the schedule, and I'm sure maybe in about uh, two weeks to three weeks' time, government will come up public with the exact date that you have it in your pocket, but it will be very soon. The last time you said you were drafting some modalities, has that been completed? That has been done, and it, it has to be communicated to organized labor, so I don't want to use this forum to break the news. So it's evident now that the workers have not received the cost of living uh, allowances. But what's their take on this? Bernard J is General Secretary of the Public Services Workers Union. In fact, they were lacing their boots to embark on an industrial action uh, before that intervention by the Ministry of Labor Relations. So, Bernard, what's your reaction to this? Uh, I need to even confirm from you it's um, uh, past July. So, are you able to confirm or deny if, if, if you've received that 15% allowance that you were asking government of? Uh, Kindly unmute for me so I can hear the points you're making, Bernard. Hear me? Yes, I can hear you. All right, sorry about that. Good afternoon and good afternoon to your cherished listeners and viewers. Um, yes, I can confirm that we have not yet received uh, the COLA has uh, agreed, the 15%. Uh, it could not be paid in July because, um, and it's understandable, because at the time we reached the uh, agreement, uh, payroll was already uh, completed and was closed. You know, uh, payroll system goes through a certain process. Uh, there are times that the window is open and there are times that it is closed. Uh, so, as workers, we knew um, that because of the fact that at the time we finished the negotiations, uh, the payroll was uh, completed, and therefore it was not possible to pay it uh, in July. But uh, obviously, uh, the expectation of all of us is that uh, the payment will be done uh, in August together with the arrears for the July uh, payment, then we could we could go ahead. So that is what has happened. It could not be paid in July for very reasonable and obvious uh, reasons. Um, but the good thing was that we were able to conclude the negotiations uh, on it and had a, had come to a fifteen percent uh, increment for cola. So that is the current situation. Uh, and was this the impression um, many of you had as leadership of uh, organized labor at the time you were signing the agreement? Well, at, at the time we were signing the agreement, uh, we were hoping that uh, the, some allowance could be made so that it could be paid in, uh, in July as well. But for us, or for me as General Secretary of Public Services Workers Union, I, I believe that uh, we must let uh, the systems we have put in place um, in terms of handling these things also run. And there was no need to disrupt uh, that system or cause any, any disruption of that system. You know, the controller system also has its own challenges and uh, any attempt uh, to try to to maybe disrupt may also cause other problems, which will come back to affect us as workers uh, as well. So there, there was no need to rush the system at the time because um, the, the period or the window had closed uh, at that time. But like I said, another payroll um, season for August is, is up and uh, we are hopeful and expecting that the appropriate uh, entries, once there's been right. agreement on what is to be paid, uh, and as I heard the chief executive of Fair Wages say, um, they have also put in place all the modalities and everything. And I'm happy he said he will not announce it here <laughs> because they know what to do. Yes, right. they know what to do. So they will go through the right process, let us know that they have completed and they are they have made the input and we are expecting the payment to, to start in August. Well, I was asking the question because um, your group was the latest at the time 
uh, to have declared some, I mean, warning that you may lay down your tools if government.